Um, and so we're just kind of diving into that because, again, we're interested in ways to um, think about small diversified farms and the opportunities. But you'll find a, a guidebook to that, which is kind of a separate topic um, on this on this page as well. So the website has a number of different things. Um, those fact sheets, if you go under suppliers, you can find a list of of uh, businesses that supply mushroom su um, inoculation uh, supplies and mushroom spawn for inoculation. Uh, you can also check out, we're engaged with the project within New York State to match uh, woodland owners um, or those that do work in the woods with those seeking mushroom logs. And so uh, we're actively doing this kind of matchmaking process as well because there's often people who want to do these types of cultivation but don't have access to the woods or don't want to do that type of work. So. Lots of aspects to this. I'll try to cover as much as I can as, as we go. I also want to mention another resource that I think is useful for anyone that's curious about non-timber forest products. Um, uh, there's so many different options, and I think it's important to present uh, people with, with the whole buffet. And so this is a multi-institution collaboration, Virginia Tech, um, University of Vermont, Cornell, um, Penn State and uh, that their extension uh, have all contributed to this, probably forgetting some folks, but this is the National Extension Network. We do have a YouTube channel, it's just called Forest Farming. You can find it under EX Forest Farming, that's Extension Forest Farming. And in addition to the same mushroom videos you might find on our website, you'll find videos on a lot of different things like maple sugaring, um, ginseng production, wild leeks and ramps. Um, and things like even like biochar and beekeeping uh, in woodlands. So it's a great resource to check out yourself and or uh, point folks to who are interested in things. So there's four main species of mushrooms that um, we can really reliably grow in the woods. If you were to walk out into the forest uh, during the growing season, you might come across one of up to 10,000 different fruiting mushrooms. Um, there's a number of different fungi. There's millions of different fungi out in the environment. And there's thousands that actually produce a fruiting body, which we call a mushroom. So fungi are a complex kingdom of organisms um, that uh, grow through these threaded white, usually white or sometimes black or brown, um, these threads called mycelium. They grow through some kind of material and then some of them actually make fruit and that's what we call mushrooms. So the four species that we've had the best success and really recommend folks concentrate on would be shiitake, kind of going clockwise around this. So top left there, shiitake. Uh, oyster mushrooms, very adaptable uh, species. Uh, wine cap stropharia, which tends to grow great um, in wood chips and uh, sort of cultivated beds versus wood. And then lion's mane, um, or sometimes known as um, bear's head mushroom. So three of these um, are native mushrooms that you can find in the woods naturally and you can also cultivate. Uh, so shiitake would be the exception. It's really only been in North America since the 80s. Shiitake we focus on primarily as a profitable mushroom because unlike those other ones, which generally you can cultivate uh, and fruit, they will they will fruit on their own schedule. You can't really control when they actually produce mushrooms. The shiitake has a long history of cultivation in different parts of Asia, China, Korea, Japan, and in that um, in those scenarios, they've they've been cultivated for a long time. Uh, lots of breeding has gone on and. And there's just this phenomenon where you can actually soak a mushroom log and get it to produce um, very reliably. So this is really what sets it apart. Um, even for hobbyists, it's nice to have something you can grow in the woods that you can expect a yield from all summer long. Basically, at least in central New York, we can get reliable harvests through the soaking method from about June 1st through October 1st. So if you're south of us, you can probably extend that a little bit further and further north um, would be less. but generally about a 16 to 20 week um, fruiting cycle on these. Before we get into the basics of inoculation, it's important to kind of step back and understand that mushrooms and fungi just really don't behave like other organisms we might think of. And most people think they're, they're sort of like plants, but a little bit different. But mushrooms are really kind of a whole different um, biological construct in the sense that a mushroom is, is the fruit of the organism and that fruit is produced to put spores out into the environment. And spores are nothing more than uh, millions and millions of microscopic little sticky packets of DNA essentially. So a seed, when a plant makes a seed, it has a protective coating. You can put that seed in your pocket. You 
you could carry it halfway around the world and you could plant that seed. But a spore is both microscopic and also doesn't have any protective coating, and so it's really limited to its immediate environment. So the strategy of mushrooms is to produce millions of spores. Those spores uh, ideally land on something that's a reliable food source, and if they do, they can germinate, and they start to grow these little threads called hyphae. Those hyphae need to find a mate, and it's not as simple as male and female in the fungal world. There's multiple different uh, sexes, if we want to call them that. You have to basically, they have to find a compatible um, uh, spore that has a hyphae to merge with. And if they find that in the environment, then they can grow and continue to expand. And unlike a seed, which can really only grow sort of uh, the roots only grow up, you know, down and, and expand outward. Um, mycelium can really grow in any direction. It can grow multi-directionally. So once hyphae have merged together and they start to form this mass, we call that mycelium. This is the important place where we kind of enter in as growers of these mushrooms. Mycelium is essentially um, a mass of hyphae, but this mass then colonizes some sort of substrate. So a substrate we call that uh, something where we might feed the mushrooms to or something the, the mushrooms are using as an energy source. Um, once it fills out the the substrate and the conditions are right, so usually for mushrooms it's at least an ambient temperature of about 50 degrees or higher. You know, mushrooms generally like it between 50 and, and 80 degrees, although they will fruit on either end of that spectrum. Once they've filled out their food source, they have enough energy um, in their mycelium, they can actually produce fruit and the whole cycle starts over again. So I'm sure if you've dug around in the wood in the wood debris or in logs, you've found this white thready material. This is good stuff. We want this in our environment. It helps break down lignin in wood. It helps break down the components in woody materials and, and helps build soil. So we can really think of ourselves as we're growing mushrooms as also being a part of that cycle of building soil and, and recycling organic matter back into the environment. So the ways that mushrooms have evolved to actually deliver their spores are some of the basic ways we start to differentiate them when we identify mushrooms out in the woods. We're not going to get a lot into wild mushroom identification. Again, that's a bit of a, a larger task, given that there could be thousands of species that you encounter. But you should know that the majority of them um, are neither edible nor delicious. Um, uh, and, and the majority of them are not poisonous as well. So. There's actually a very small group of mushrooms out in the wild that are both choice edibles or medicinals and um, that are actually um, safe. Uh, so mushroom identification can seem very overwhelming at the outset, but there's actually a good opportunity to, uh, to get into that as well. With cultivated mushrooms, we're just, we, we don't have a lot to draw upon. We have four or five different species we can work with, and some of them fall into these categories. So guild mushrooms are the most uh, prolific of the of the groups. There's the most number of species. They're the hardest to identify and differentiate. Three of the mushrooms we're going to focus on fit into that group, including shiitake. Although when you cultivate something intentionally, you pretty much eliminate um, other competitive fungi, and you don't have to worry that you're going to pick something that's not a shiitake or a, a oyster or something like that. One of the tooth mushrooms. There's very few tooth species, but they're pretty interesting. Really beautiful form. Lion's mane would be included in that group. So those little teeth or icicle kind of looking things um, are actually what deliver the spores. And then you'll find a number of different polypores out in the woods. These basically have holes on the bottom of their fruiting body, and that's what distributes the spores. A lot of common uh, delicious edible mushrooms, chicken of the woods, maitake, turkey tail, etc., would fall into this category. And it's really important once you get into cultivation or especially once you get into wild foraging, it's essential to learn how to take spore prints. Um, spore prints give you information based on mostly the color of the spore print um, to help you lead to a positive identification. So a spore print is nothing more than taking a fresh mushroom, putting it face down on a, usually I use a paper bag, something like that, to capture them, leaving it for about 24 hours, sometimes less if it's really fresh. And then you get this nice pattern that you can use to help identify. So if I was gonna go shiitake, Again, if I'm cultivating a log intentionally, it's very unlikely I'm going to find um, a uh, competitive fungi on that that's not a shiitake, that looks like a shiitake, anything like a shiitake. If anything were to show up, it's likely some kind of bark fungus that's going to look completely different. But if I wasn't sure, um, I could take a spore print. You can see here one of the species we might be concerned with it um, 
showing up would be Gallarina. This is a poisonous mushroom. But if we were to take a spore print, we would see that the Gallarina has a, a brown to black spore print, while the shiitake has pretty much a pure white spore print. Um, and that should be said, we've never found a Gallarina um, on an actively fruiting log. The only time this might actually be dangerous um, is when you, uh, at the end of a life cycle of a shiitake, you often toss that log into the woods and let it further decompose. And sometimes another fungus will colonize that and, and use that as a food source. And that's when you can run into problems is, is you see that old log that you got rid of years ago and you say, oh, I think there's a, there's a shiitake on there and you go and pick that and you don't pay attention. And that's when you can run into, into some trouble. So um, folks often ask about, you know, can I find a mushroom in the wild? Um, can I cultivate it like I would, you know, potentially save seed from a vegetable plant or something like that? And the answer is yes, you could, but you, you need a pretty complex, uh, not, not a, I don't want to oversell it. <laughs> it doesn't have to be super complex, but you do need basically a sterile environment to do this. Um, because spores are so small and because it's really important in the propagation process to isolate uh, the, the spores of the mushroom that you actually want, from all the other potential spores out there, there's millions and millions of spores floating around in the air right now. They're in our lungs, they're in our bodies, especially during the growing season, they're everywhere. So you have to isolate the one you want and make sure it's it's a pure culture. And so this requires some kind of sterile environment with a clean room, with some filtered air, um, with some different uh, tools and, and some expertise in order to complete this. So the good news is for most of us, we're probably just gonna buy material from spawn producer who has that facility and those skills and spawn is relatively inexpensive um, we estimate it's you know 50 cents to a dollar per log to inoculate it's really not that expensive so unless you want to really want to get into that type of work or more more kind of laboratory type work um, you'll probably end up buying the material from someone else but just to let you know this is how it happens if you were to find a mushroom in the wild starting at the left uh, top top left corner of the screen Beautiful mushroom, you want to propagate it. Um, the outside of that mushroom is probably contaminated. There's probably other things that have landed on it. So it's brought into a sterile environment and it's actually broken open. And a little piece, a little cutting is taken from the inside of that mushroom, which until it's broken open, has been sterile, the inside. And that little piece you can see there on that is placed on a Petri dish on like an agar medium, which is basically potato starch, a little bit of sugar to get it going. A couple weeks later, you have, a, you have the mycelium starting to grow from that piece. You're, you're sort of doing what you do when you clone apple trees. You're actually taking a genetic sample, and with apple trees, you graft that onto a rootstock. With mushrooms, you're basically taking that little sample and growing it out in a small area on that Petri dish. Once that's colonized, you can then take a sample from that Petri dish and add it to sterilized grain. Usually grain is used because there's a bit of nutrition in there to feed the mycelium. About a month later, you can transfer that to sawdust. And for most of us, this is what we're gonna buy. Uh, you can see on the bottom left there, that's a bag of sawdust recently inoculated. About a month later, it's fully colonized. And that's usually when it's shipped to you to actually use for outdoor cultivation. So what you're essentially getting from these companies is a young sort of vigorous sample of mycelium, which is really important. And it's important that you try to time your order to, with the time you're gonna inoculate, because what you wanna do is get that as fresh as possible and introduce it to your logs or your wood chips as soon as you can um, before it starts to weaken. So all the mushrooms that we're going to focus on and that we can successfully cultivate generally are what are called saprophytes. Those are decomposing mushrooms. They basically eat dead organic material in the environment. It's not uh, feasible really to cultivate mushrooms like morels, chanterelles, um, porcinis, these types of things, truffles. They're very hard to grow. And the reason for that is they're what are known as mycorrhizal fungi. Those fungi form complex and beneficial relationships with trees and other plants. And from a growing perspective, that's a very hard thing to sort of uh, replicate. So we mostly focus on these decomposing species. And a lot of them are already out in our forests and woodlands doing this work. So we can really, again, think of ourselves as just participating in this decomposition process. And rather than nature choosing what mushroom decomposes wood, we're gonna choose. And we're gonna choose something that tastes good and potentially has a good market. So I'm sure folks are aware, um, we have lots of woodland resources. Um, you can see the map here um, with some recent estimates of forest cover. Lots of opportunity. These are young forests. There's lots of opportunity for what we might refer to as uh, timber stand improvement. 
which is where we recognize that some trees are faring better than others. Some trees are likely to be the mature specimens in the forest. The forest is essentially going through a process of thinning itself out. So some trees are going to get bigger than others. We can remove those smaller diameter trees in the meantime and help that canopy develop, help those, those healthiest trees do well, and produce a lot of material that's great for mushroom production. And a lot of folks, uh, when they walk into the woods and aren't familiar with forest ecology, they think that when they look at the tree diameter, that's telling them something about the age of the tree. Most forests that we walk into are actually what we might refer to as even age stands, where the trees pretty much all started uh, relatively at the same time. And what you actually are seeing is the playing out of genetics and site conditions and sometimes luck. Um, so this is an example from a farm near me where we have a sugar maple tree. Uh, that stump there is a 90-year-old stump pretty vigorous growing sugar maple. Uh, that cookie was cut from a tree just next to this one, same species, same site conditions, also 90 years old. So what's going on here? This is the expression of genetics. Obviously one of these trees has a lot more vigor than the other and perhaps uh, got a better start in life early on. So the forest does this. We can pay attention to these kind of dynamics and that small diameter tree is never gonna be uh, a behemoth in the woods. It's not gonna be a good timber tree. Um, it's probably not going to live to be 400 years old if our goal is to have old growth sugar maple in our woods. So we can cut it, we can thin it, um, give some more space to those trees that are doing the best, and, and those are mushroom logs. So this is what I, what I like to think about is we don't go into the woods looking for mushroom logs. We go into the woods to do good forest management. The mushroom logs are just a byproduct of that. It's, a, it's actually an incentive for us to do timber stand improvement because I can take one of those small diameter trees down, I might get 10 mushroom bolts out of that. And each of those bolts might make me 15 or $20 worth of money if I wanna go and sell the mushrooms I produce on them. That's a pretty good incentive to go cut that tree down. This is a sugar bush that we thinned early on. Um, it's our in, uh, part of our farm and we were looking to remove some of these smaller trees, you know, give some space to those, those excellent species that we wanted to tap. It's really important when you do maple to make sure you're giving your, your maple trees uh, as much sunlight and access as they can so that they, they're healthy and they can, they can handle the stress that you potentially introduce with tapping. Um, although if it's done well, it can be pretty benign. So, you know, sugar bush management and mushroom production actually go really nicely hand in hand because you often have a lot of this material. And certainly you often need firewood with uh, sugar bush management, but you can kind of get, generally get both of those products. So with these four species, this kind of summarizes um, what types of wood they want to grow on. So another thing from forest management perspective is, you know, we're looking at what tree species we have available to us and what we might be able to do with them. So you can see here, shiitake is the most adaptable in terms of the types of wood it can grow on. Um, oyster tends to like softer deciduous trees, the softer woods, poplar, tulip poplar. Um, uh, basswood, some have had luck on willow, uh, box elder, these types of things. Lion's mane is pretty exclusive just to beech and sugar maple. And then the wine cap strafaria does really well, as I mentioned, on mixed hardwood chips. And often you want to incorporate some sawdust ideally into that. So each species has its own set of preferred tree species to grow on. And it also has a preferred method. And it's really interesting. We never really figured out in the research we've done um, why some mushrooms prefer one method over the other but they do. Um, oyster is the most adaptable. You can grow in almost anything, but especially with lion's mane and shiitake, we've really found that the specific way we go about it seems to be really important. So here's some example. Here's oyster. This is golden or yellow oyster growing on uh, quaking aspen. Um, and uh, this is a really fun one. I call this, these are chainsaw inoculations because really all you need is your chainsaw and a bag of spawn. Spawn is a purchased mycelium that has is, is been made for inoculation. So you can literally walk in the woods, you cut these trees down, um, you cut slices, you cut them usually into about 12 inch sections, you layer that sawdust mycelium in between each piece. You wait about a year, sometimes two years, depending on the size of your, your log, and then the mushrooms will fruit. And again, I don't know when they'll fruit, no one really knows, but it's a nice surprise and it's a good yield usually when you get it. This is a lion's mane growing on sugar maple stump. This is actually in that same woodlot where we did a thinning for sugar bush management. 
one of the things I love to do with lion's mane in this instance is I'm thinning these trees. I'll take the top part of the tree and use that for shiitake logs. But the bottom often has a flare and tends to be much larger. So we'll cut the stump kind of high, about three feet off the ground. Do the same thing, cut it into one foot sections, layer the mycelium in, and 12 to 16 months later, usually you see these mushrooms um, fruit. Lion's mane is very particular to the fall, so often your flushes are going to be um, in late September or early October. And then Stropharia, of course, um, I like to encourage people to put these mushrooms anywhere that you're already mulching. So I've inoculated uh, areas where we mulch our fruit trees or um, perennial flower beds or um, even some certain vegetables or, or berries that I might be putting wood chips in. They, they do great in a wide range of sunlight. This is in a woodlot that we maintain at the Cornell campus. Um, just a bed of wood chips that we set up in the woods. You can see some totems in the background. So we're kind of doing a demonstration here. And they're really quite easy. It's almost like making a lasagna. You put down ideally some sawdust, you sprinkle the spawn on top of that, and you put some fresh wood chips, and you're pretty much good to go. Um, again, I'm breezing over some of these methods. I'm going to dig more into the shiitake, but you can find the resources on how to do these and watch some videos on our website. One more we're, we're just starting to play with um, is the Namiko mushroom. Um, this one I'm excited about from a forestry perspective because it prefers black cherry as a substrate. And these logs are inoculated very much in the same way as the shiitake, um, but they're actually usually buried in wood chips uh, to encourage them to fruit well. So each mushroom, just keep in mind, it has its own particular wood species, its own particular technique. There are other mushrooms you can purchase out there that you can trial, but you know these four, or this, this, this one might be the next one I'd recommend, are going to be the most reliable, um, the most successful. And I think part of this is not because we couldn't grow potentially more mushrooms, it's just we haven't really been playing with this and experimenting long enough to really understand what's going on. There's almost no field research going on at universities. There's very little breeding research. The interest is very high, but um, so far research hasn't caught up with that. And so it's a very slow developing process. Luckily with shiitake, this is a mushroom that's been growing for thousands of years uh, around the world. And so there's a long track history of cultivation. And so we're really ready to potentially bring this mushroom into what I might say prime time. Um, and really it, it has a great marketability, has a easy success rate, really nice one, a product. Again, if you're interested in hobby growing for your own consumption, but very easy to scale up and actually start to produce and sell these. And just for full disclosure, <laughs> um, in addition to teaching about these things through extension, I do also grow these with my wife on our farm. Our farm's called Wellspring Forest Farm, and, uh, and shiitake's been a big part of what we do, and it's been a really well-received product in the market. So the log-grown shiitake um, are different than the shiitake you might find in the grocery store. Most of those shiitake are grown indoors on blocks of sawdust, and the log-grown shiitake really, um, you can't compare the flavor, the texture, the taste, the aroma when you have these fresh mushrooms coming out of the woods. They just really... Uh, overwhelm the, the store-bought sort of uh, sawdust grown ones. And, and we see that in the price as well. Growers are routinely getting at least double, if not more, the price per pound for these, these premium shiitake. So this is really a niche crop, and what growers do best with is when they find niche markets to sell it to. What you need for shiitake are fresh logs, pretty much for all these species. You want to use fresh materials because that's basically relatively clean from any other contaminating fungi. So if you cut down a tree and let it sit there for a year, something else has probably already claimed it um, from the fungal perspective. So fresh wood, we say less than three months old. You can also, you can cut logs and inoculate them on the same day. So anywhere from day one to, to day 90 is a, good, is a good bet. We generally with shiitake like to have logs that are four to eight inches in diameter and about three feet long. Some people like them a little longer, some people choose to put them a little bit shorter. I wouldn't go any shorter than about 24, 26 inches. And that kind of all depends on what's comfortable for you to move around, because you are going to be moving these logs around and you want to be able to pick them up and, and move them around with, with some ease. The process of inoculating is basically three stages. You're going to drill holes in the logs. You're going to fill them with the spawn, the mycelium, and you're going to wax over those holes for the third step. 
So it's important to uh, not worry about this being perfect, but you want to drill your holes so that the mycelium is pretty evenly spread through the logs. And you really don't want to drill too many holes because you're just wasting materials and it takes a lot of time to fill them up. And so what we've generally found is that four inches between the holes in one row and about two inches between rows is a good um, uh, distance to strive for. So you kind of form this diamond pattern. Um, the diagram here is actually not quite accurate because the vertical uh, arrows there should actually be between the first and second row, not the first and third row. So you want two inches between each of those three rows. And you do this kind of pattern all the way around the log until you've come back to where you started. Um, the easiest way to do this is with um, what's called an angle grinder. This is something that folks in the mushroom world have retrofitted to a, accept a drill bit that is about 10 times faster than a corded drill. And you'll find very quickly, you can certainly use a drill. When I started, I just used my regular old drill, but the logs are quite um, hard, of course, the wood is hard and uh, it gets tiring using the drill, we'll just say that. Um, so the angle grinder becomes a much faster way, especially for commercial producers to do this. It pretty much sucks the drill bit right into the log, makes it easy work of the, the task. Once you've drilled those holes, you need to fill them with the mycelium. There's a couple different options of what form that can come in. Uh, the most common is a sawdust, and you buy these little tools. You dunk it in the sawdust, and then you plunge it into the hole, and it basically fills the hole with that mycelium. You can also do uh, inoculation with uh, dowels, little sections of wood that are colonized with the mycelium that you can just hammer in. Most people, when they start out, they might do the dowels because you already have a hammer. You don't have to buy the other tool, but often they quickly switch to the sawdust. Again, especially at larger scale, uh, mostly because it's it becomes a cheaper material to purchase. The third step is to wax. Uh, the reason we wax is to protect that mycelium. Um, woodpeckers, chipmunks, different critters are often interested in mycelium, um, and so you want to protect it. You also want to keep moisture in the log, and so you want to seal up the hole and just protect the whole thing. So you generally use a cheese wax. Um, these are, again, this is materials available from the mushroom suppliers. Cheese wax is some kind of blend of paraffin. Sometimes it has beeswax in it, and it just sticks to the log really well, uh, especially if you get the material hot enough. It'll it'll stick and it'll hold during the, the period where the log is, is actually colonizing. So I'll just mention, we did a research project um, several years ago, and uh, farmers were generous enough to um, collect data and actually tell us uh, what their experience was with mushroom uh, inoculation from, from the harvesting of the logs, through inoculation, through managing, through harvesting, through selling. So we, we added up all their time, and we figured out that basically the, 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 most, the longest expenditure of time was in inoculation. So we really like to stress that it's important to make sure your inoculation setup is as efficient as possible because you can lose a lot of time, you can spend a lot of time, and that can really hurt your bottom line if you're interested in, in commercial sales. So a lot of this data, we have a nice booklet on the website. It's called Best Management Practices for Log-Grown Shiitake in the Northeast, um, although it does apply to a lot of other climates. Uh, it, it summarizes a lot of this data and really helps direct people who are interested in commercial production to understand the choices they make so that they, they optimize their time. And this is not unique to shiitake, this is any farm enterprise. If someone wants to do it in a way that's viable, they have to think about how they're spending their time and how they can constantly be improving that time. Of course, if this is hobby for you, you may not want to rush it at all. You may want to take as much time as you, as you can. So <clears throat> what happens basically is you inoculate that log that log's not going to be ready to fruit immediately because as I mentioned before in the life cycle, the mycelium needs to grow through the log and basically occupy um, the entirety of the log before it's ready to fruit. And in our climate, that takes about six months of growth in temperatures that are at least 50 degrees. And if you're not aware, um, we have winter here. So generally speaking, we have about six months of warm temperatures that fit that criteria. And we have about six months of winter although sometimes it's a little bit longer. So it's really important to think about when you're gonna inoculate your logs and, and to recognize it's gonna take a while before they're ready to fruit. 
since six months of the year is pretty much winter, we can pretty much say that 12 months from when we first inoculate that log, it's going to be ready to fruit. So in that 12 month time, what we do is we just stick the logs in a shady place out of any sort of intense winds, which can dry out the logs and we leave them be, we don't worry about them. So you can see here's our logs sitting in our woods uh, covered. Um, we have a sugar maple woods. My ideal would be a conifer shade because it would provide shade year round. We don't have that. So in the winter we have to cover our logs with shade cloth. You want to think about a place that's shady. I mentioned protection, protection from the wind is really important. You also want to think about a place that you have good access to because once you start fruiting, you're actually going to want to check on them pretty routinely, especially in a, in a business uh, sense. So there's lots of different ways to stack logs. The key thing with stacking them is you maintain airflow. So you don't want to stack them so close together as in that dead pile so that you trap moisture, you actually will encourage other bark fungus to grow and that'll break down your log and usually shorten its life. So these other methods you can see maintain open airflow, but also are efficient in the use of space. And this kind of comes down to grower preference and depends on how many logs you actually manage. Our farm, we manage about a thousand logs. And so we use a number of these different stacking methods to, uh, to organize them. Generally, after about six months, we usually inoculate uh, starting here soon in March or in April. Generally by October, we start to see this at the end of our logs. This is a good sign. This is the mycelium that started to show up on the end of the logs. And it uh, kind of follows the pattern of those plugs. That's a good sign that our logs are ready to fruit. And oftentimes in a regular year with good rainfall, by October, if we inoculate early in the spring, they're actually ready to fruit, but we don't usually fruit them until the next spring because we want to make sure they're really ready to go. We've talked about the laying yard. That's where we lay our logs. You can see here's one arrangement from a grower. He has a nice hemlock woods. He's used some old pipe here to keep them off the ground. It's really important, no matter what stacking method you choose, that you minimize the amount of log that's actually touching the ground. If you lay it down completely on the ground, it's just going to break down all the quicker. So. This is a nice method. It takes up a lot of space. Some of those other methods uh, allow you to use less space for the same amount of logs. So that all depends on your preference and what space you might have available. You're going to need access to water because as I mentioned at the outset of this, the key to good production is going to be soaking these logs in water. And what's been found over time is that the colder the water, the better, and certainly the cleaner the water, the better. And if you're selling these mushrooms, it's really critical that you test your water and make sure that the bacteria count isn't too high, um, especially if you're using surface water. Most surface water sources have some level of E. coli bacteria. Um, the acceptable level is about 200 parts per milliliter for irrigation purposes. Um, so that's what's allowable for organic vegetable production. I would encourage you to go even lower than that because mushrooms are um, soaking in this water and they're about 90% water. So I usually say shoot for a threshold of 100 colonies per million or less. So a water test is relatively inexpensive. It's important to know as a grower what your water is and make sure it's as clean as possible. You can certainly use a natural body of water. Um, a lot of growers end up using tanks. That's what we use at our farm. Um, it's easy to empty those tanks, move them around, fill them with logs, and then fill them with water to perform the soak. You soak the logs for about 24 hours, and that's what's going to actually encourage them to produce mushrooms. Usually growers um, set up some kind of really simple rack so that when they pull their logs out of the water, they can lay them up because those mushrooms are going to fruit kind of on all sides of the log. So you want to give them some space uh, to, and we call this an A-frame. You lean the logs up against this and then they fruit. It's also recommend that you often cover those logs. The worst thing that can happen um, is you have this nice flush of mushrooms and then the day before you're going to harvest them, the rain pours on them and they get all soggy and wet. So the, the shade cloth in this case, you can use agricultural fabric. Some people use tarps. It'll help protect those mushrooms and, and preserve them before you're ready to harvest them. Generally, the harvest is about seven to 10 days from when you pull those logs out of the tank. And you can see here, the harvest really varies uh, per log, but essentially it's usually uh, on average, a quarter to a half pound of mushrooms per log every time you soak it. Now, the life of a log is generally, uh, our research has shown about three growing seasons, and it can be soaked about eight times in its lifetime. 
And what happens is early on, as you can see, some of these logs are really covered in mushrooms and some less so. Early on in its life, the log usually produces more than a half pound every time you soak it. But as that log tends to break down and decompose and get older, it tends to produce less than a quarter pound. So that average is really an average over its lifetime. It's not something that we are gonna see year after year. Just like us, we tend to be more vigorous when we're young and then at some point we hit our peak and we, we start to degrade a bit, right? So it's kind of the same process with these logs. So you can see in here, we have a mixture in this group of logs that we soak year one, year two, year three logs, and that helps kind of balance out the harvest. It's really important to harvest these mushrooms at the right time. Um, often growers who are new to this send me pictures very excitedly. Their first mushroom harvest, they send me the picture in the bottom right. We like to call these pancake mushrooms. They are still perfectly edible. Um, they might be hard to sell though. They don't last very long in the fridge. They might last a couple days and they tend to start to yellow or brown very quickly. The picture on the top left, is really ideally when we want to harvest, when that cap is still kind of curled under a bit. So if you imagine the mushroom is popping out, it then starts to open and the cap actually separates from the stem. So that one with the green check, that's about, uh, about 80%, 75, 80% open, and 100% open would be the one with the red X. And it's perfectly edible. If you're eating them yourself, it's probably gonna be just fine. Um, but if we're thinking about a marketable product that we want to have a good shelf life, then we need to really think about the timing of our harvest. Prices are all dependent of market forces and what people are willing to pay. But we've worked with growers, um, very urban areas, semi-urban and suburban areas, rural areas, the whole mix. And generally for log grown mushrooms, you can get these prices, 12 to 10, uh, excuse me, 10 to 12 dollars wholesale, 12 to 16 dollars uh, retail. Wholesale generally is uh, selling five or more pounds at a time. So for instance, to a restaurant versus retail might be setting up at a farmer's market and selling them by the quarter pound or half pound um, at a time. It's really important with mushrooms if you're going to sell them. And I, I'd argue if you're going to eat them yourself is to think about sanitation um, as you harvest because different than other vegetables or other food products, there's no washing step. You can't really wash mushrooms because they're mostly water. And if you add them, if you wash them further, they'll actually, uh, their quality will degrade quite rapidly. So when we work with farmers and growers, we really stress the importance of making sure your hands are clean, making sure you don't, you know, do the animal chores and then go to the mushroom yard um, and, and really minimize any sort of contamination. We always harvest into cleanable containers. So we always think really carefully and clean our tools, make sure everything's good to go really important with mushrooms, um, important with every food product, but especially with mushrooms. So the key with um, doing that soaking cycle is that you can't expect this log to fruit and then and then immediately fruit again. Um, you can think of a log as kind of like a car battery. Um, if you overstress it, which is basically what we do when we, when we soak it, we need to let it recharge before it can be soaked again. And what we found through research is that takes somewhere between six and eight weeks and so we need to basically soak our logs on a cycle if we're interested in routine production. And at first it might seem overwhelming, like how do we, you know, if I have a thousand logs, how am I gonna keep track of who's in what week and when they've rested and all these different things? It's, it's pretty easy. Um, if you can count to seven, uh, you can do this. So I'm gonna go to this slide first. Basically, no matter how many logs you have, if you have seven or 70 or 700 or 7,000, you just divide them into seven groups. So we're kind of taking the middle of that six to eight week rest time. So some growers rest longer, minimum would be six weeks, but we usually recommend people think about seven weeks. And so if I had 700 logs, each group would have um, 100 logs in it. The first week I wanted to soak, I would soak that first group, number one. Second week I'd do group number two and so forth. By the time I got through group seven, I would just know that uh, group one had fully rested and was ready to go again. So in our mushroom yard, we just keep our logs kind of separate and we number them, make sure we know who's who, and we just count through seven all summer long. So the process is take one of those groups, soak it for 24 hours, put it up on the fruiting racks, and then rest, and then repeat. So if you do the math, um, the orange and red boxes here show that basically you can usually soak 
May, June, July, August, September of the year. Now, May is always a bit tricky, especially in central New York and anywhere north of us. It doesn't always warm up enough. Um, sometimes October is actually warm enough, so that, that, that timing can shift a bit. Um, now, you can actually also get what are called cold weather strains of shiitake. Those will actually fruit on those shoulder seasons. And you don't actually soak those, they just fruit on their own. And so you get a lower yield, but you do get a product. So you can actually theoretically produce mushrooms from generally through March through November every year. Although the peak of your production is gonna be in those warmer summer months. And so if you do the math on that seven week rotation, generally speaking, you soak logs somewhere between two and a half to three times every year. So just to give you a sense, how many logs might I wanna inoculate. You know, if I wanted to soak one log a week, give my family a little meal of mushrooms, I could have seven logs and that would get me started. Uh, when I started, I did about 30 logs. That was soaking about four logs a week and it would generally give you about an, an average of a pound of mushrooms. That's a nice nice uh, size if you want to eat mushrooms regularly. Small business, you know, probably need to produce at least 10 pounds a week to start to sell them a little bit. That'd be about 350 logs. Generally, we start to recommend good enterprises being around a thousand logs or more, where you really start to get you know, 40, 50 pounds a week and you can really make a good business out of this. So last thing I'm gonna talk about and I'll take any questions. Um, mushrooms in the woods are really fun. Uh, they're really somewhat easy to grow in the sense that you don't really have to provide all these specific climate conditions, the woods really provides the optimal scenario. You can see there's some movement of the logs, there's some management, especially with the shiitake. There's not actually a lot of pests with mushrooms, which is nice. Um, you'll sometimes find, 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 find weird, weird insects or bugs. Generally, they don't do much to the mushrooms. The big nemesis, if you're a mushroom grower, is slugs. Um, and if you're a gardener, you're familiar with slugs probably intimately. They can be a real pain. Um, they're not fun to remove, and they can seem like they just completely come out of nowhere. Um, so we've learned a lot about slug management, and growers are really adapting some pretty basic things just to make sure that, that slugs um, are reduced to a minimum. So you have to have a slug plan going in if you're really going to produce these, especially, again, if you're going to think about selling them. So the first thing we recommend is to, those areas that you set up for fruiting, you actually want to remove the organic matter and replace it with something that will drain well, won't hold water. Because if you don't do that, um, you're creating basically the highway which slugs can travel through. So, and, and you don't wanna leave the soil bare, that's not good for the woods. And also what that'll happen is during heavy rains, it'll actually splash mud up on your mushrooms. So wood chips, um, gravel. I know a grower who uses old roofing membranes because uh, he says he can sweep them keep it clean and the slugs don't like to crawl over them whatever it is you have to do something kind of set this area up a little bit second thing is that that fruiting blanket that cover actually really helps you um, protect from slugs as well it kind of keeps the spore load down slugs are blind they actually are attracted to the, the the smell of the spores that's why they like beer because that yeast that's in the beer gives off that smell and that's what attracts them so it's the same thing so this actually helps as well And then what growers have started to do, which I think is great, this is from a, a grower in New York, is build their rack so actually they keep the logs up off the ground, uh, minimizing the amount of opportunity for the slugs to crawl up on them. So this fella had a pretty large slug problem in his yard. What he started to do was um, he built this, this bottom rack. You can see there's only four points of contact between that rack and the ground. And so he keeps the logs off, off the ground and basically it reduces the, the opportunities for the slugs to show up. And this is a quite a nice picture of productive shiitake logs. Um, these are probably all first year logs, but it gives you a sense of what this could look like. And since he's done this, uh, he's reported that his slug problems have gone way, way down. So management uh, really comes down to getting in that soaking cycle and then being able to visit your yard because these mushrooms are gonna fruit and mature at slightly different times. Um, so generally within a two to three day window is when you can expect to, to harvest these um, mushrooms. One of the other exciting things is if you don't eat or sell all your mushrooms fresh, you can actually do a number of different things with them. They're one of the most versatile species I've come across where you can think about value added production as well. For most of us, we're definitely gonna consider drying them. Uh, 
These can be both for mushrooms that we, we don't consume fresh, we're not able to sell, but also ones that maybe don't look so good fresh. You can dry them and they actually tend to look okay. Um, dried mushrooms are, are an interesting product in their own right. Um, they're just as valuable as the fresh mushrooms and obviously you get the benefit of an increased shelf life. Um, a properly harvested fresh mushroom can often be stored for a week before it doesn't look so good. Um, these will last six to 12 months once they're dehydrated. And generally in our cooler climates, um, dehydration um, occasionally can happen in the sun, uh, but at least um, part of it can happen in the sun. And the, the benefit of actually drying mushrooms in the sun, interestingly enough, is that the mushrooms actually accumulate, they, they uh, technically convert, but they accumulate vitamin D. Um, and so you can actually supercharge your mushrooms with vitamin D. If you're not familiar, vitamin D is something we're often deficient in, especially in the wintertime. Our bodies can't make our own vitamin D from the sunlight during these uh, colder months. And so this is actually a way to kind of store sunlight for winter. It's pretty interesting. And our farm website, uh, wellspringforestfarm.com, there's an article that I wrote several years ago about this benefit of storing sunlight for winter. So it's kind of an interesting uh, product. The sun-dried sh shiitake also look really nice. These are sun-dried ones here. Um, generally speaking though, you can put them in the sun for four to five hours and then you need to finish them in some kind of dehydrator. And if you're going to sell these, then you have to get into well, what regulations do I need to follow for a dried product to, to make sure these are safe and legal for sale. So at our farm, we generally, if it's a sunny day, we start them out in the sun, we finish them in the dehydrator. It makes a really nice product um, that we can sell all year round. A couple more things here. This is, uh, there's a whole bunch of information on our website about the, the, the enterprise aspect of this, just to give you a sense. When we factor for labor, um, generally it costs just under $5,000 to establish a thousand log operation, but that's gonna start to yield you after a couple seasons, about a thousand pounds a year, and that should produce at least uh, $10,000 worth of gross income, which is a target that we're interested in in New York State because that qualifies our landowners for ag exemption for their property. So um, you can find out more about that on the website under the tab that says viability on it. Um, another uh, interesting thing that's showing up as we develop this industry in New York is that people are interested in growing mushrooms, but they're also interested in providing the wood uh, for other people to grow, um, or there's a lot of people that are interested in growing, but you know, again, want to buy the wood in uh, and get started. They either don't have the skills, the machinery, the land, or the time to actually cut their own wood. So another kind of opportunity for woodland owners is to look at this potential market. Um, generally speaking, in a cord of wood, there's about 150 three-foot mushroom logs, and these are the prices that we generally see happening. Uh, for these materials, if, a, if someone wants to offer cut and delivered logs, they can usually make between 300 and 450 a cord, which is considerably better than what you get for firewood. Uh, around us, it's usually averages around 200 or 225 a cord. So um, the difference here is you really have to take care of these logs. You can't beat them up and, and scuff up the bark in the same way um, that you would with firewood because you don't really care. You have to take some extra extra caution to make sure they're really intact. This is an order of logs I got several years ago um, from a friend who does a lot of woodwork and I'll pay him, um, you know, again, $2.50, $3 a bolt. Does well for him, does well for me. I'm ready to go in the spring and uh, everybody's happy. So that is the brief run through of Woodland Mushrooms. Uh, I'll take any questions in the chat box if folks want to follow up with anything. You can see the Corn on Mushroom website as well as our farm website there if you're interested in learning more, seeing how we do things. And uh, appreciate everybody uh, tuning in. So thanks. Well, thank you, Steve. That was fantastic. I learned a whole lot, and I feel like I'm ready to go out and start growing mushrooms. Um, I love to wildcraft mushrooms, but I haven't grown any so far but I feel much more confident about it after listening to your talk. Um, one of the questions that came up for me, and I'll just get it started because I haven't received any questions from anyone, is can you suggest um, any local or regional locations to purchase spawn? 
Yeah, so I think it's important with spawn. Um, it's sort of like shopping around for seeds. And so depending on what you're looking for, um, it's not always the closest vendor. <laughs> Each mushroom company specializes in different things. Um, so again, on our Cornell Mushroom website under suppliers, there's a whole list. Um, some of the folks I've used before, uh, and there's not a ton. It's not certainly not as available as uh, as like a seed company. But um, Smug Town Mushrooms is in Rochester, New York. That's probably the closest. Fungi Ally is in Western Massachusetts. Um, has spawn and materials. Um, let's see. North Spore Mushrooms is up in Portland, Maine. Uh, and then Field and Forest is in Wisconsin. Um, and so there's room actually for more uh, potential producers of the spawn. Again, you kind of need that laboratory sense. I, I certainly found early on that that wasn't my skill set. Um, but those are some good ones to check out. And there's others on the website. And folks on these, these companies are really interested in your success. So um, you can really tap them as a resource to say, hey, I got, you know, I got 50 logs and I want to do shiitake. And they'll usually help you uh, figure out the amount of spawn you need, the amount of wax, and they'll put it all together. And often they actually sell, you know, pre-made kits of this is for 50 logs, this is for 100 logs, whatever it is. Um, and so they can really help you get started. Thank you. So as you were speaking, we had a number of questions come in. Um, from David, he asked, do you ever have to moisten freshly inoculated logs in a dry year, especially before you start soaking them? Yes, that's a great question. Um, our research found that the natural moisture log in, in most wood that's cut is about 80%. And the mushrooms will survive in as low as 25 or 30%, which is getting close to pretty good dry firewood. So. Generally speaking, you don't have to do anything in that first year because the moisture content is high. Now, I'd say if there's like severe drought, like we had a couple summers ago, um, we did soak our logs to hydrate them. Just I think it mostly probably made us feel better, but um, I do think it's important in a, in a severe drought or dry conditions. So that looked like um, we just soaked all of our logs for about two hours to rehydrate them. And um, I think that's a good recommendation for dry years. but. If it's a normal type year or if it's excessively wet, then you should be okay and good to go. Great, thanks. Um, Siobhan asks, is the soaking step absolutely necessary or can the logs be set out to let them do their own thing? Yeah, so um, traditionally in Asia, a lot of places that these mushrooms are grown, like uh, some of the islands in Japan, they get, uh, in excess of 80 inches of rain a year, and they, they don't actually soak their logs. The, the rain is enough uh, to do it. And, and technically in this climate, you know, where we might get 35 inches on average, 40 inches of rain, you can leave them out and they will fruit eventually. Um, and and that's, a, that's suitable for, for home growers. I wouldn't say it's very suitable if you want to make money doing it because you're not going to get that consistent production. Um, but, but yes, you can. Um, I would say overall, the, the log is still going to break down, and so you're going to get less mushrooms over time. Um, but you will get fruiting, and it's a fun discovery. And if you're not concerned with maximum production, then certainly you can leave them. And often after heavy rains and when there's a dip in temperature, you'll see those mushrooms show up. OK. Um, so Steve, when you buy bolts in the fall, does the clock in parentheses for inoculation essentially stop with the freezing weather oh that's a good question mm -hmm. yeah it's a great question i mean essentially it slows down so that three month freshness window can be um extended a bit um because yeah there's just not a lot of comp competitive fungi out in the world out in the air um during during the winter um so you could be a little flexible on that. Um, it's recommended if you're not going to inoculate right away, try to leave your logs in as long a, a length as you can because that just helps retain moisture and keeps fungi out. So I often will leave them in those six foot lengths or sometimes even nine foot lengths and I'll cut them just before I'm ready to inoculate them and that does help. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely kind of stretch that a little bit. And I didn't mention, but um, we did do research at Cornell we did cut and inoculate logs um, every single month of the year. It does work pretty much any time of the year that you do it, although it's slightly better if you cut in the winter and inoculate first thing in the spring. 
Okay, um, so this question's about hackberry. Uh, Alton has a lot of hackberry. Are there mushrooms that will grow on hackberry? And when do you harvest the logs? What if you don't harvest at the optimal time? Yeah, so again, you know, you can cut and harvest, probably inoculate wood anytime. Hackberry is not one I've worked with uh, very extensively. Um, it's it's worth, again, contacting some of the suppliers because those kind of more, less common woods, um, people have various experiences with. Um, I might recommend, for shiitake, I might recommend talking to Field and Forest because they've tried a lot of different species. My guess would be there's a there's a lot of different strains of shiitake, just like there's you know a million different strains of tomatoes, and so there's probably one that you, you could have success with, um, but it would require some experimentation. So what I'd recommend is you know start with uh, ten logs, uh, try to try a few different strains, and see if you get any success before you commit too much. What about chipping it and uh, growing stropheria? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. So um, stropheria is pretty pretty adaptable um, and so you could definitely do wood chips and, and have good success I would think yeah okay uh, David has another question and let's see oh can you soak logs in the winter and bring them indoors to fruit um, if the only way you could probably achieve that is if you kept the logs uh, in a space that was in the 50s so Theoretically, if you kept them like in a basement or if you had a heated high tunnel or something, it would work. You can't really let the logs freeze and go dormant because the mycelium kind of goes to sleep and then expect them to wake up right away. It takes generally three or four weeks for them to wake up. So you'd have to maintain them in a warm space as well as soak them in a warm space. So, yeah, if you had that type of facility, sure. Um, we've, we've fruited logs all winter in, in, the, in Cornell, in, you know, inside the building. Um, now, if you start fruiting inside the building, you're getting away from that woods and so you got to think about things like light temperature humidity sometimes you have to modify those to get good mushrooms okay uh looks like we have one more question here and then i think we'll wrap up because we're a little bit over time already um what what conditions are good for a morel bed and yard yeah so morels as i mentioned they're in that category of mycorrhizal mushrooms and Lots of companies will sell you the spawn. It's actually really to eat, relatively easy to make the mycelium, but to actually get them to fruit is a whole other thing. Um, the best lead I can give you on morel cultivation is Trad Cotter and Mushroom Mountain, which is a business down in South Carolina. He's had the, he's been working on this for a while. So again, it's uh, morels partner with trees, so you have to kind of set up that scenario, and it's it's a bit tricky. And there's a lot of different theories. You'll find a lot of YouTube videos that have different ideas about how it could work and not. So it's certainly a, a very experimental venture and I would you know, definitely recommend his book. He has a great book called, uh, I think it's Organic Mushroom Farming in, um, through Chelsea Green Publishing that, that also talks about morels. So it's certainly something to try and I would, I would encourage digging in, but it's certainly not for the faint of heart. So you should also inoculate something that you're gonna have good success with. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Steve, for taking the time today to speak with us. Um, yeah, like I said before, I learned a lot. I've got a lot of responses here from folks saying that they really enjoyed it. It was a great program. Thank you so much um, for the overview. And yeah, please join us again next week. Uh, we'll be learning about biochar from uh, Mr. Gilmore with uh, DCNR, Pennsylvania DCNR. And we hope to speak with you again sometime soon, Steve. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye, everyone.